uh, we have remained a democracy. And that's no mean achievement, considering our billion people. We were held elections regularly, except for a brief period during the emergency when our constitution fundamental rights were suspended. Uh, but we have demonstrated to the world that uh, democracy is part and parcel of our society. Whereas in other countries, especially our neighborhood, which is also supposed to have the same history as ours, uh, they have not been able to have democracy. And I certainly think that the main reason we have democracy in India is because we are 83% Hindu. And it's a Hindu, Hindu ethos, which is very conducive uh, for questioning, uh, for decentralization, uh, for doing your own thing, and having your own opinion. And these, uh, this ethos has contributed very heavily for the roots that democracy has in India. And it is this Hindu religion, culture, that we need to defend. Uh, because if it disappears, there will be no democracy in India. Richard Nixon. India has not broken. And uh, India has remained one. And this is also a, a great achievement. And this also I attribute to the common cultural links that Hindu uh, society, Hindu religion has been able to afford. And uh, finally, we have demonstrated leadership in information technology, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals. India is a growing country. And so there's much to celebrate. But there's also hemorrhaging going on. And I'd like to speak to you today, this is an Indian audience, I'd like to speak to you about the hemorrhaging that is going on in India. Because praising ourselves amongst ourselves uh, is not necessary. And the hemorrhaging uh, has taken in the form of the Hindu society being under siege. Hindu society is now, but for a problem I had with Mrs. Indra Gandhi. I had, was a professor, I was a junior professor at Harvard, I became an assistant professor, associate professor. Then the Indian Institute of Technology offered me a full professorship at a very young age, 29, which is unprecedented in India. And I accepted it and went back to India. But very soon I found that uh, the, the ideology that Mrs. Gandhi was propagating was the Soviet, pro-Soviet ideology. And India needed, you know, according to me, a market economy. And I they recall that I had seen that picture in the, in the room of one of the Indian students who had invited me to his uh, place for lunch as a professor. In, in America it's very common for professors to go for lunch with students. And I still remember that photograph. So I, I, it was in my mind that someday I must go and see Parmachari. And it happened in 1977 election. There was a Tamil Nadu uh, election for the assembly after the parliament election in which Janata Party came to power. And I am now the sole surviving founding member of the Janata Party because everybody else left it. I am the only one who has not left it. And uh, But I I remember that I was campaigning and I was passing through Kanchipuram. And uh, there was a crowd, in, it was not in the, in the Kanchi Mutt, but it was in a village a little away, maybe 20 kilometers away. And there, there was a small hut and there was a big crowd, lots of cars. So I asked my people, what's going on here? Then they gave me the name, they said, Paramacharya is here. That's why everybody is here. So I said, oh, then I want to see you. And I went to uh, the hut where he was sitting. And I appeared just like that. There were other people also standing. And then he looked at me and he got up and went inside. So I, I didn't know, you know, some, something about me must have upset him. That's why he went inside. So I started to leave. Who were looking after Paramacharya came running, said, Perivar on the Kupadra. So I went back. So 
So he asked me, how did you leave without? He asked me, Tamil Uttar Villama, you can't be dead. So I, I saw you, uh, you saw me and you went inside, so I thought you didn't want to see me. So therefore I decided to leave. No, no, I went inside to get this piece of paper. And he, he gave it to somebody, he gave it to me. I opened it and it was a question answer with my photograph in uh, those days there was uh, uh, there was an Indian Express magazine called Dinamani Kadir uh, or something. I, I forget what it was. Uh, and uh, the question was that Subramanian Swami is regarded as a hero of emergency. Is he a chameleon? So the answer is yes, yes, he is from Sholo Andan. So it's it, it from uh, Tamil Nadu. He's from Tamil Nadu. So he asked me, Nida na is there? So I said yes. Then he said, now you can go. <laughs> that first meeting. <laughs> and uh, second meeting happened after, after about a year, pretty away, and spent uh, at least an hour and a half with me, speaking about everything political. But he made it clear that he normally doesn't speak politics. And, uh, but he is making an exception. And I took that to mean that uh, I should not give it in the newspapers as many others were doing. And he traced the whole Indian history so magnificently for me short while. He even explained to me that we should oppose E.V. Ramaswamy Naikar at the brain level, he said, not physically. Because he is one man and he has turned his so he told me, your job is to work on ideas in politics. And you do what you think is right. Don't chase position, don't chase money. When it's required, both will come. I must say, when people said that I dare to stand and dare to speak, it's that original inspiration which is guiding me. Because I found when I have been in difficulty, money has come. I found when everybody had written my career off, I became a minister. So, therefore, there is that, uh, obviously, uh, a, is the blessings in this background. And therefore, over the years, I have been interacting with him. So today, when I speak to you about the Hindus under siege, many of these problems he had told me much earlier. And said sometime or the other it will come. So one of them was, was conversion, which we didn't take very seriously. Today it's a very serious problem. The other is terrorism, which is also directed against Hindu, Hindus only. Only Hindus die in, die in a terrorist attack. Religious conversion, only Hindus are getting converted. Nobody else is getting converted. If you look at the uh, at the, uh, at the rubbishing of Hindu icons, it is the Hindu icons who are getting rubbished. The arrest of Swami Jayendra Saraswati is, a, is taking place only in the, because he happens to be a Hindu uh, Swamiji. And obviously the reason was that he was going amongst the Dalits and he was a challenge to the conversion forces and they worked through Jayalalitha and got it done. And Jayalalitha was a willing tool for that. I hope she regrets it someday and makes uh, thus prayaschit, proper prayaschit for it. But the fact of the matter is that that also, look at the history book distortion. Look at what is happening in the United States. Recently there is a book now, I think uh, two days today, in which we are hemorrhaging. We are definitely hemorrhaging on terrorism. We are definitely hemorrhaging, the Hindu society is hemorrhaging on conversion. We are hemorrhaging in the fact that the propagation is taking place against Hindu religion in a very insidious way. It is the direct against the Hindu religion. Even the globalization as it, it gets translated in India, it's attacking Hindu institutions. The family is a very important institution for as a shock observer where a country doesn't have social security. But uh, the globalization is increasingly putting pressure on nuclear families. Nuclear families are a disaster. They haven't worked in the United States. And uh, 
certainly in the United States with all the social security can perhaps even uh, have it. But India with no social security cannot go for nuclear families. So these, uh, I was taken aback that you should be asking me this question all of a sudden. <coughs> so I said, they have come to Afghanistan, tomorrow they will come to Pakistan, then they will come to India. That is their pattern. No, no, don't waste your time on Soviet Union. It will be finished. It will break up. 1980, at the peak of Soviet power, I would say, you know, I said, I can't believe that, you know, I, could, I couldn't say to him. <laughs> I, uh, I said to myself, is he saying? And that's exactly what happened. The Soviet Union broke up into 16 countries, become irrelevant. They doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. They told Namudri Pad that for years you've been saying there's no inflation in Soviet Union, there's no unemployment in Soviet Union, there's no poverty in Soviet Union, now there's no Soviet Union also. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, here is, you know, the perspective that I got. Then he said, I said, then what should I do? So he said, India needs only two friends, China and Israel. And we were having the worst possible relations with both at that time, when he told me this. He told me this in 1977, that India needs only two friends, China and Israel. And now, Radu Bihano real name is Tadalpur Pandit Kapadir. So I said, uh, China, uh, Israel, the country doesn't even recognize Israel. <laughs> they won't even give me a passport to go to Israel. How I can develop the relations? They said, no, no, no. That's all he would say to me. But every time I came, he would ask me, have you done anything about Israel? Have you done anything about Israel? And China. I said, China, they have taken away our, our territory. They are our enemies. How can we have, how can we have it? No, 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 no. You need them. You must know when to make friends and when to make allies. So I said, how do I know when to make friends and when to make allies? So he says, Vishma Chari Upeer Ketra Kya. In fact, I didn't, I was brought up in the north, so I didn't know much Tamil. In fact, I could hardly speak Tamil. So he, he, used, to, he used to appreciate, uh, he, used to, he never spoke to me in anything except Tamil. But he said, one day you will start speaking in public meetings in Tamil. <laughs> public meetings in Tamil. My own style of Tamil is different from the Dravidian Tamil. But, Everybody understands my Tamil, nobody understands Karna in this time. <laughs> uh, with China, you, you have to do. Then, of course, I happen to be an expert on China, I speak Chinese. So I made a contact. And soon enough, out of the blue, to the surprise of everybody, uh, the Chinese invited me to visit China. Then, Moraji decided to trade of course to China. So I was wondering how I can go. I was an MP of his party. He was a prime minister. So I went and met uh, Murari. He says, Chinese? How can you go and have any dealings with them? They are enemies. So I come back uh, uh, before I go further on that. I asked Parnacharya, how do I decide who should be friended and who should be who should be opposed? So he said, Vishwacharya had given an Upadesh to Arjuna. And they were after the battle was over. And he cited a, a story about a rat and a cat. He said, those two can never get together. But there was a rat who was living in a hole and it couldn't come out and play because the cat was sitting on the top of the tree watching for it to come out so it could pounce and eat it. So the rat was very unhappy. One day he found the rat shrieking. So he came out and looked and he saw that a hunter had put some net and the cat had walked into it and the net was, you know, that's an old hunter method of, of catching animals. And then uh, and the hunter, uh, that net had gone up and it was suspended from a tree. So the rat was very pleased and it started dancing around, moving around, you know, which, uh, having the fresh air which it could never have, till a snake came. And now the rat was too far away from the hole to go back running. The snake would have pounced on it. 
So it didn't know what to do. So it proposed to the cat that see you are stuck there and you can't get out. But I have sharp teeth, I can cut the net. And I have this problem with the snake. I will come and jump into your net. And you must shriek in such a way that the snake gets afraid and runs away. And save me. And then I will cut the net and let you free. So cat said definitely, deal me. <laughs> <laughs> so the rat jumped into the, uh, into the, into the net. And then uh, the cat shrieked and the snake went away. So now he said, now please open the net. So the rat slowly started cutting. The cat said, what are you doing so slowly? You can do much faster. There the hunter will soon come. He said, no, no, I'm doing my best, I'm doing it. So it delayed, delayed, till the hunter started coming. That time the rat quickly uh, bit the uh, net ropes and the net uh, broke loose and the rat jumped out and the cat also went and climbed up the tree. So the hunter came, he saw the, you know, the net in this state, didn't know what to do, just picked up the net and went away. And then the rat came and peeked out again and the cat said, why did you take so much time? You broke an agreement with me. He, the rat said, I knew that if I had cut the net immediately, the first thing you would have done is eaten me up. Because that's your nature. <laughs> so I had to wait till you found another danger before you. <laughs> so therefore, never make an alliance with a person whom you are doubtful about, unless you are sure there is an escape route also. You know, that he can, without you, could face a bigger danger. So that philosophy you should follow. You have to make alliances. And he said, with China also, you have alliances. You make an alliance with China, but always keep some door open. You know, somewhere China might be afraid of some other country. At that time, the Soviet Union. So keep a balance, he said. Because now it will be the United States. So he said, with that in mind, you. Forget about all this border and all that, you can take care of itself. You make up with them, they will make up with you. So I, as his blessings was there, I told the Chinese embassy, I would you know, like uh, to meet the ambassador. The ambassador, the first thing he did was call me, because nobody was used to visit. And that too, a member of parliament, I was general secretary of the party at that time. And so, he immediately invited me and said, we would like you to visit China. Kailash Mansur Ramadana, okay. Go and see if you uh, go and see it also. But the Chinese that time had shut the place up. They wouldn't allow anyone to go. But I was received by Tan Xiaoping, their biggest leader, and I proposed to him. To his credit, Tan Xiaoping said there are some roads which have to be developed, etc. For 35 years, nobody has gone. So I'll open the. I'll get it all done. And if your people want to build a temple also, I will allow that. All this, I just couldn't believe. But for Parmachari, it could not be possible. But he said one condition. You must go first to Kailash and Mansur. Now, I've never climbed, uh, walked more than one kilometer in those days. I, mean, uh, I used to lead a, a typic, typical urbanite uh, existence. Because nowadays, I walk quite a lot. But uh, those days I had uh, hardly walked, and certainly not up a mountain. I had to go 22,000 feet up and then cross into Tibet. And uh, so everybody dissuaded me when, when it was clear that Kalash Mansur would be open. But it, uh, I had given this promise that I was going to be the first one to go. So he, um, uh, everyone persuaded me, why are you doing this? You will fall off the cliff, you will die, the people go there to die, you don't do it. Finally, I went to again to him. He said, I don't know And indeed, I went to do that. It was a hard job, but I had no incidents. Went and saw Kalash and Mansarovar. I had a bath in Mansarovar. And since then, every year, 500 people are going. I got it open. I would have never thought about it. 
And I never would have believed that the communists would do it. In fact, that time, what Al Bihari Vajpayee was the foreign minister, he told me, you are spoiling our relations with the developing relations with China now. First you go and open it, and then after that, you uh, you want them to do things which are religion. They are, they are communists. They, you know, they will take it ill and so on. But Moraji told me, don't worry. You raise the matter. So, like that, throughout there has been this kind of guidance and now today what I'm going to speak to you is part of uh, the perspective that he gave me or Majari gave me in politics. I know very well that this is what will happen because one day I, I was in, I was stuck in a, uh, in near Velour with a flat tire wondering what to do because there is nobody around. Suddenly I find uh, from Kanchipuram one car coming. And uh, they, they came with a the mechanic, they fixed my car. So I found it, you know. So Parmacharya said, Swami repair, tire puncture it. So you drove the people. So that kind of backing I had, I had, I remember that uh, when the Janata Party was broken by VP Singh, I didn't join VP Singh. Everybody thought I was mad because that's where everybody went. But he told me you've done the right thing. And then he told me, you come for my birth, birthday celebration, it was in May 1990, 95th birthday, I think. Mm. Something like 95th birthday. Was. And he put me on the same stage as Rajiv Gandhi. In the invitation also, the two names are there in one of the programs we to address. And he said, you and he are going to be together. And uh, Rajiv and I became, we were already known to each other, but became like brothers, very, very close friends. Then he was assassinated. So I told him, this horrible thing has happened, I need to do something about this Prabhaka, who's ordered the assassination. What is the proof? Kashmir, majority Muslim. What happened to the Hindus? They are driven out. They are living in refugee camps, terrible, squalid refugee camps. Take the case of Mao, a district in UP, 65% Muslim. What's happened to the Hindus there? They cannot celebrate Diwali, they cannot celebrate Ramayana. They cannot have Bharat Milap broadcast on, on microphone. This is the reality. In Tamil Nadu, there are 40 town panchayats. There's one called Mel Visharam near Velo. There people came to me. Vishwadu Parishad uh, actually also took me there. And there I heard a shocking story. I never thought it would happen in India. 75% of Mel Visharam is Muslim. 25% is Hindu. Town Panchayat election, 100% seats went to Muslim. And the Muslim, after getting elected, told the Hindus, you want any amenities, one word. Otherwise, no amenities. And literally, if you go there, Muslim area, fully developed, with all the amenities, Hindu area, total barren, no roads, no schools, nothing. In fact, their agriculture has been ruined because the Muslims had set up uh, tannery factories and the polluted water came for irrigation and destroyed the crops. So I asked the people, what do you want? They said, they, either they should give us amenities or they should partition the town to check. So I went to court and I was able to get a court order that the governor should look into these complaints. And the governor, Sujit Singh Banala, was known to me, he told me that uh, either it will be partition or the amenities will be. <coughs> but there are 40 such town panchayats. Wherever Muslims are in majority, there is no secularism. The majority will see how the Hindus live there. You have to visit it to know. There is another place near Rameshwar called Tondi. 
40 such places are there and all over the country because their religion is very clear. Your identity is transnational and your purpose in life is to promote Islam. If you are Darul Islam, that is if Muslims are in power, then your job is to convert the remaining, otherwise reduce them to what they call as demi status or uh, um, and make them declare them kafir and kill. Demi status means you do menial work. So their, their, their concepts are very clear. Our problem is, we think we are good Hindus if you go to temples, celebrate Diwali and do puja at home. That is not enough. What we need is a Hindu mindset. Which means that not only we will do all this, do puja, we will go to temples, we will celebrate Diwali. But when Hindus are in trouble anywhere, we will all feel united. That is the movement that we have tried to launch in the country today. It's slowly picking up. Rama Setu project I took up only because I know that Karunanidhi selected this route because it would involve breaching the Rama Setu. country that I have shown Ram his place. They rubbish Ram all the time. And I use this argument in court also. If you want to know the detailed argumentation though, about Rama Setu, I'd be happy to take it in the, uh, in the question time. But we have to have a Hindu mindset. Now what does that mean? I have a book, uh, you have some yes, here, 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 where I have described in great detail. But first of all, what is India? The identity of India. In this country, they are worrying about identity. So Professor Samuel Huntington of Harvard has written a book, Who We Are. And he says, all said and done, United States is a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, English-speaking identity. And everybody else has a guest of the United States. This is professor of Harvard. And he's well, not an ordinary professor, he's a very famous professor. Because the United States is worried now with all the Filipinos coming, Mexicans coming, the Asians coming. What's going to be the identity of this country? Our identity is very clear, it's much simpler. Because DNA has proved that we are all the same people. Both National Geographic and a variety of other researchers, there's one researcher uh, who's in California. Uh, who uh, has done, who's an Indian, who's done at uh, the University of Cal uh, Southern California, done a tremendous amount of work on DNA, all we are the same, irrespective of caste. Whether we are Muslims, Christians, Hindus, except, I mean, the, the, the spectrum of DNA is the same throughout India. Complexion might vary because of the sun, pigmentation of the sun. It's done nothing to do with race, nothing to do with DNA. So if we are all the same, then what is India? India is a land of Hindus plus those others of other religion whose ancestors are Hindus. Whose ancestors are the Muslims? Whose ancestors are the Christians? They're Hindus. And the Muslims and the Christians should own up with pride this Hindu ancestry. If the Muslims say, no, no, I am a descendant of Ghazni or Gori, then go to Pakistan. You don't belong to India. But if you stay in India, you shouldn't have a voting right. We need to develop this identity. We need to ultimately rethrone, as Shankara did, Sanskrit as a language of communication. It can be done through Hindi by making the vocabulary Sanskritized. I sat with a Tamil dictionary produced by Madras University, which is Dravidian dominated. And that has 40% Sanskrit words or common to Sanskrit. The, the Tamil scholars say, no, no, this is all Sanskrit borrowed from Tamil. I said, I don't mind. As long as it's normal. 40% of the words. 
Once I remember I was in a meeting with Karnanidhi and he was telling me, Sanskrit Ma Maharaj is Sriya. He said, then why your name is Karnanidhi? Is it a Dravidian name? You say that your election symbol is Udayan Chinnam, Udayan Suryan Chinnam. I said, these are all Sanskrit words. Chinn is Sanskrit word. The Tamil is full of Sanskrit words. Of course, Malayalam has more, Karnataka has more, Kannada has more, but even Tamil has 40%. So teach the people the common words and make them <coughs> ultimately it has to come. This Dravidian word was used by Shankara, Adi Shankara first when he went to challenge Mandara Mishra and they asked him who are you? He said I am Dravida Shishu which means the child of a the southern regional area. It has nothing to do with, with the race. They say no Brahmins are Aryans and uh, others are Dravidian. Then I said, Rahul Dravid, is he a Brahmin or not a Brahmin? <laughs> and furthermore, I don't think that till very till a thousand years ago, caste had anything to do with birth. The original idea of caste was devolution of power. What were the sources of power? Knowledge, weapons, money, and land. And the Hindu sages decided that none of these two, no two of these should be in anybody's hands. One hand. So if you had knowledge, then you didn't have weapons. You didn't have land, you didn't have wealth. If you had uh, wealth, you didn't have weapons. If you had land, then you had you didn't have you didn't have the right to teach and impart knowledge. And that is why if you adopted the discipline of that caste, you became of that caste. That's how Valmiki became a Maharishi. His parents were not Brahmins. Veda Vyasa's mother was a fisherwoman. And she became, uh, and he became a Maharishi too. So Ramayana is written by a non-Brahmin. Uh, and uh, uh, Mahabharata is written by a non-Brahmin. But they are both Maharishis. The Rishi of Rishi is Vishamitra, he uh, was a Kshatriya. Kalidasa was a, was a Dalta, was a Adivasi, was a hunter from, from the uh, forest communities. But they are all Maharishis. In fact, if I were to think of a prominent Brahmin in our scriptures, it is Ravan. Ravan was a Brahmin. And, and these DK idiots didn't know that. And they were uh, anti Brahmin in agitation, they were praising Ra Ravana. <laughs> now they have stopped it because I have publicized that Ravan was a great Brahmin, Pandit Brahmin, but because of his Ranka, his Arambhav, he had to be destroyed. And we don't worship Ravan. Even today's Brahmins, those who call themselves Brahmins, they don't worship Ravan. They worship Ram, who is a Kshatriya. In fact, none of our gods are Brahmins. Krishna was the Yadava. Rama was the Kshatriya, like that. Or the, the, the caste could be decided. So, I think this caste system became irrelevant the moment it became connected with birth. If you, people with four different castes. Or forget caste altogether. We are Hindus first, and let us be Hindus last also. So, therefore, this concept that we are indigenous to this area of India, we didn't come from outside, this Aryan Dravidian theory is totally bogus, and uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, are, we regard this country as a land of Hindus, and those others who acknowledge that their ancestors are Hindus. Because artificial intelligence, they, are, they have decided there is no need to invent a language which is computer savvy. Sanskrit they say, computer savvy language, and therefore they have given up the research on a separate language and they have adopted Sanskrit. That's why Sanskrit is being taught in a big way in this country. And we need to bring it back. Even if I don't know Sanskrit, my children can know Sanskrit. My children don't know, then their grandchildren should know. And it's easy to teach, and ultimately that is the way to unite the nation further. So that is one requirement to fight terrorism. To be motivated by your, your acceptance. You have to have a law which says you cannot convert by inducement. 
you can convert if somebody individually wants to convert. If it's a collective conversion, then there must be inducement. And you have to have it investigated. And this feeling people are developing in India because Congress government in Himachal Pradesh has enacted a law banning uh, induced conversions. Veer Badra Singh, who is the Chief Minister of Andhra, uh, excuse me, of, uh, of uh, Himachal, he told, uh, I am not going to say, uh, go by the opinion of Sonia Gandhi on this issue. I am going to go by what is required. The Christian missionaries are playing havoc in Laul Spiti area of, uh, of uh, Himachal, and therefore I am going to have this law. He's passed this law. <coughs> so therefore, uh, we need a law which prevents the forcible conversion or the conversion by inducement. Swami Jayadar Saswati went to Dalits, he went to their temples, he gave them that. That is the main reason why he was targeted. Of course, Jayadar's good friend Sashikala did the murder. And uh, having done the murder and the pressure from Sonia to do something about Jayadar Saswati, Jayadar stupidly came to this conclusion and betrayed the religion by saving Sashikala and putting the blame on Jayadar Saswati to meet the demand of Sonia Gandhi so that Sonia Gandhi doesn't prosecute her in disproportionate assets case and many other cases which are pending against her. I hope uh, she realizes her mistake and makes does perhaps it because our Hindu tradition we do have a, a method by which we recover our own people who are lost to us. That is called prashchit or in Tamil prashchitam. So, uh, therefore, uh, the, the integration of Hindu society by recognizing there is no caste or caste governing with birth, this will, will strengthen our, our basis. I think uh, that would be perhaps the call of Brahmacharya. He one day told me that uh, what we need to do is what Adi Shankara had said from the beginning. That we are one whole. Adi Shankara set up four months and one for himself, namely in Kanchi. And the idea was the unity of India. And he was very keen. Today, almost everyone admits that we want to deal with the problem of Pakistan, we have to have good relations with China. Today, not those days, those days the Soviet Union was so upset when I went to China and came back that Kosygin came all the way from Moscow and demanded that time be given in Durdashan on 15 on 19th March 1979, Kosygin appeared on the television of India, Durdashan which was the only channel those days, <laughs> and said, my dear friends of India, be careful of the Chinese, they have betrayed you once, they have betrayed us, they are most undependable people. I do not agree with the government of the day, he said. I don't agree with the Janata government that you should have normalized relations with China, that they are undependable people. That is the extent of hostility that has created. But today, you want to deal with Pakistan, get the neutrality of China, Pakistan is five minutes work. They say that when uh, Pakistan was broken into two, uh, Bangladesh and West Pakistan, then Pakistan should have been renamed as Pakistan, you know, what is Pakistan? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, today, it can go break into five in no time. Because Baluchis don't want to be a part of it. Baluchis were never part of Pakistan. It was Nehru's weakness that he disregarded the call of the Baluchi, uh, Baluchi leader and said, no, no, it is part of Pakistan. Baluchis never agreed. They were an independent country and the British, before leaving, had made them an independent country. But the Pakistani army went and took it. Those decide that they will think as Hindus, they should demand of political parties a Hindu agenda, 
and they should come out and vote as Hindus for once. People say, why are they everybody appeasing Muslims and Christians? Because Muslims and Christians vote as Muslims and Christians. If Hindus decide tomorrow to vote as Hindus, you don't have to worry about these people. You don't have to have all Hindus also. 83% are Hindus. 40% get majority. In our system of elections, all you need is 40% vote and you will become, you will be the majority party. We need, <coughs> uh, what we, what I say is that we need to regard the Hindu vote as sacred as Swami Dayanand Saraswati has been repeatedly saying, we need a movement in which Hindus decide that for once to set right our problems, to bring the character of India back as a Hindustan country, a country of Hindus and those others whose ancestors are Hindus, that we need an instrument in a democracy, that instrument can only be, that weapon can be elections and in elections we must all vote as Hindus. That is what I am not saying you vote for this party or that party, whichever party accepts a Hindu agenda, you should vote for that. That should be the approach that we should have. So, to meet the siege, if we go into the teachings of Paramacharya, which is documented now in the form of a book, you will see whatever I have said in various, in various chapters, various three. It was a great experience for me. For me, it was a totally unexpected experience. It happened because I saw his image suddenly come before me when I was hearing. And sometimes he comes back in my dream. In the dreams, anything can happen. I remember uh, I didn't have that much. I knew Jandra, Swami Jandra Saraswati very well. I knew Vijendra when he was not even a Shakracharya. As a little boy, uh, I went to the, uh, Kerala to the ashram and uh, I found that uh, Swami Jayendra Saraswati is there. So I said, let me stop and say hello to him. So I went inside and he, as soon as he saw me, brought in about 14 boys and made them all stand. He said, they're all learning Sanskrit and so on. He said, one of them I'm going to select as the successor Shankaracharya. Who do you think it should be? So I saw Vijendra Saraswati, I think he had a different name then. He had Tejas in his face. I said, this boy looks as this. He's already cut off. He said, yes, I've already selected him. And it has been communicated to Paramacharya also. <coughs> so I knew them very well. But after the um, Samadhi of uh, Paramacharya, my connections, with my frequency of going to the uh, Shankara Mat had been reduced. When this took place, I knew that your Jayanta Saraswati Swami and Jayanta and all had been meeting and Sajikala had gone and I was on the other side so there were reasons for me not to go. But as I was returning from uh, from the United States, uh, it was in November and I uh, remember that I couldn't sleep because there was a nice uh, seat which could uh, almost uh, double as a bed. And I got to sleep and suddenly he came in my dream and said, Jena, wait till you come to So that day I decided to go. And when I started speaking, already people are saying, oh no, there must be something in it. And that nobody wanted to speak. And those of you who spoke, Jayata put cases on them. And so, uh, I began speaking. Jayata didn't put any cases against me because she knows she puts one case on me, I'll put ten on her. So therefore, there's that, uh, you know, two bullies in a, in a, in a street, uh, you know, they have an area. They don't interact with each other, so you manage your <laughs> <laughs> So she puts a case, I'll put ten cases on her. Uh, I'm nothing personal against her. I know her personally very well. I've not met her for the last seven years after she went with, Jay, uh, with Sonia Gandhi. I broke off with, uh, with her at that time. But I do feel that this, uh, this, uh, this issue became so important. For uh, it, was, it is not Swami Jayadak Saraswati being targeted. It was Hinduism was being demeaned 
by this. And now you don't need any personal opinion whether the case is genuine or not. The Supreme Court, while considering the bail application, asked the Tamil Nadu government, give us all the evidence you have. And after that, the Supreme Court said, there is no prima facie basis for this case. We would be dismissing this case, but this is a bail application. Maybe the government of Tamil Nadu will come up with more evidence in the future, because they are still in the investigation stage. But as of now, because it has no prima facie basis, we give bail. This is Supreme Court. Among the things that uh, they said, Amongst the things the police said, said to the Supreme Court is that there are 32 letters which uh, uh, Shankar Raman, the murdered man, has written, of which some of them are addressed to Jaina Sassu. And therefore shows that, and they show a lot of hostility. And therefore there is uh, proof of hostility. So the Supreme Court said, give us all 32. Why are you giving us only those select letters which were, let's see who all is addressed to. One letter is addressed to Sachikala that unless you return the diamond necklace which you stole from Vardaraja Pallumal and replaced it with a with an imitation, I shall go public and make an announcement. It appears that even the blackmailer perhaps. You should have anyway gone to the police saying that Sachikala has stolen the diamond necklace. So why is no case on Sachikala because of that letter? If you can have a case on Jainar Saraswati. Because of those letters, why not against Sashikala? Similarly, they need to have put him in jail, in like a common criminal in in Vellore uh, uh, jail. Shaykh Abdullah was accused of treason, and he was kept in a, in a lovely bungalow in uh, in Kodikana, and he was kept in dark bungalow. Even Birappan, they were planning to put in a dark bungalow, in a, in a tourist in a, in a in a circuit house. But of course he was shot dead on the on the road. But they had prepared one uh, uh, one uh, the circuit house for him. What is the compulsion that you have to send the person to jail? There is no even compulsion even to arrest a person. Under the law, cognizable offenses, the police have an authority to arrest for investigation purposes if the person is is unknown and he can melt into some crowd and disappear. Nobody can say that Swami Jayendra Saraswati can melt into a crowd and disappear. So they could have kept him in the, uh, in the ashram, in the, excuse me, the mat, and said, please don't leave the mat, we want to, uh, be, you, you to be available for investigation. But they have put him deliberately with the criminals. I visited that uh, uh, jail, I, I went and saw for much, uh, to uh, Periva. And that's all he told me. He said, I'm only upset about one thing. And what would Paramacharya have thought? That's all that I'm upset about. Because he was in tears when I saw him. There was no need to keep him. It was to demean Hinduism. It's in a sophisticated way. In the past, we have had invasions. But now, we are not having physical invasions. We are having mental brainwashing. We have to break out of the brainwashing, which is the reason why I wrote this book then, I hope. Any of you have any questions, any contrary opinion, anything, you would be pleased to ask me that. Thank you very much. Samuel Huntington. Yes. You have written a book called The Clash of Civilizations. Yes. And in that book he talks about alliances towards the end. He talks about Hindu-India yeah. aligning itself with the West. Yeah. Is what we see in Iraq today an indicative of the conflict to come? Is it is it a political conflict or is it a religious conflict? And what should India's position be with that? I mean, do you agree with Huntington's yeah, thesis, yeah, first yeah. of all? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a major problem with Islam because the educated Muslim has suddenly decided that Islam's missionary work is extremely important and therefore it is better to die for it than allow, uh, you know, it's, it's not do it something about its propagation. So we have a problem and I don't believe in this theory about a good Muslim and a bad Muslim. A Muslim in majority 
will never be the same as a Muslim in minority. You have to understand that, that you have to understand you go back, not to Quran alone, because Quran is not Islam alone. People quote Quran to say how much peace, this, that. No, you have to read Sirah, the biographical part of Muhammad's life, which is also considered part of Islamic theology. And, um, uh, and uh, Shariat. These three together have to be taken together. And uh, the educated people have absorbed it, and that is why you find most of the terrorists are not poor people who, did, you know, who don't have employment and all that. They are people who are very well to do, and they are leading the terrorist movement. So I would certainly say that the Islamic leaders today identify Jews, Christians, and, uh, and Hindus as the common enemy. This is Osama bin Laden's public statement, not once, but several times. So, that doesn't mean that we take it out on our Muslims. We, we, have, to, we have to bring them around. And I told you one way to bring them around is this. And I would say 80 to 90 percent of Indian Muslims are people who want to live in India. Who privately acknowledge that their ancestors are Hindus. In fact, they are good friends of yours, they are even identified. Whether you know whether it was from this part of India or that part of India and so on. M.J. Akbar had the courage to write a book in which it's about blood brothers or something, which he said my my grandfather was a Rajput. And he converted because it was <coughs> we have, we, there was no other way to survive. <coughs> so in India we must try to co-opt the Muslim while being absolutely clear that you are not going to submit to this. This capitulation that took place when B.B. Singh's daughter, uh, when uh, Mohammed Mufiz uh, Said's daughter was kidnapped and they let five terrorists out. And later on by Vajpayee when he let Mohammed Azhar and uh, two others out on uh, Kandahar. That is the way to encourage them. I also was a minister, and in my time, the, uh, the person present, the water resources minister Saifuddin, so the daughter was kidnapped by J.K. And we didn't release a single person, and yet the girl was not only released, but she was put on a auto rickshaw and dropped in the residence of, of uh, Saifuddin Souls because we identified the organization J.K. and we found that three of its office bearers are living in London. So we sent our agents to London with Israeli help, and that's why I think Parmacharya must have told me about Israel. And we visited those three people and said, you will be all shot dead here if that girl is not released. In 48 hours, but in 24 hours they released her. You cannot capitulate to terrorists. If they do violence in Kashmir, remove Article 370 and ask your one million of your one crore ex-servicemen, here is five lakh rupees, go and settle down in, in Kashmir. <laughs> if they uh, throw bombs in your temples, send your army and take over Kashi Vishwanath, uh, the mosque near uh, next to Kashi Vishwanath. If they still continue, then take over Vrindavan, Krishna temple, where the mosque is next to, which Aurangzeb uh, deliberately uh, destroyed. <coughs> so there, you have to retaliate. And that retaliation has to come. The only problem is that the United States is a very cost-benefit oriented society. The moment their work is over or they find the cost is going against them, they have a habit of quitting. They quit in Vietnam, they are now talking about quitting in Iraq. So, I feel that the the, I, in fact, I'm convened a conference uh, in memory of the advice given to me by Parmacharya, a conference which Harvard University and Tsinghua University in Beijing are co-sponsoring in Cochin on, uh, in January, where uh, uh, the topic is India, China, United States Triangle. Which two countries should be against the the third, because the ideal thing would be 
that India and China be together and have a contractual relationship with with the United States. Contractual relationship with the United States is workable because they keep contracts very. Uh, <laughs> when the first Gulf War was going on, the Americans came to me uh, because the Prime Minister sent them to me, uh, saying that they wanted their planes coming in from Philippines to land and refuel in India and then go to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. So I said, what will you give me? They said, will you have charged so much for landing charges for commercial flights? We'll give you three times that. I have three times that, I don't, that's peanuts. So then they said, what do you want? I said, I want two billion dollars from the IMF without any conditions. They said, how is that possible? I mean, why, uh, I mean, uh, IMF, IMF is an international organization. I said, don't block me. 87% of the voting power in IMF is the United States. So if you want, you can do it. Then he said, but today is Friday. I said, yes, it's Friday morning. In America, it is Thursday night. So you got the whole of Friday. <laughs> Have it on Monday, otherwise don't come back. On Monday, I had $2 billion and we gave them the rights. That's the way to deal with the United States, I, I believe. I do think that uh, the Jews and the Hindus and the Christians uh, are in the same plight, but I think you can, Hindus and Jews can easily combine. And even in China today, they are talking about harmonious society with Buddhist values. So it is possible that over a period of time China may evolve. And uh, I do think uh, that there is a big grain of truth in what Huntington said. But I think uh, the more important thing for us to remember that after the clash of civilization is going to come the clash of religions. And there Hinduism and Christianity are going to be pitted against each other. I went to, uh, once to Mervatur Radhikala. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. He's got a huge following. And I was speaking to him about all this. He said, our mantra is going to He said, what? He said, I said, no, I'm not telling Always a very debatable thing. There is no one right answer, and as a politician, it has also been very closely involved with that religion. I am looking at what is it that the youngsters of today can really do to take from this, because it's great. We have all these big gatherings. We talk about it, and at the end of it, we just go back home and status quo. There is nothing that has changed. What is it that you would say one thing that can be done by the current generation, including I'm talking about up to 20, if I want to who can really do that too. Age is not really a barrier if you really want to take something new and uh, push it forward. What is it that can be done instead of just always talking about the clashes between religions or with the political leaders, whether in the form of film or whatever, because we don't get to know what exactly is going on in India or other places. We all know that everything has a political agenda, which is a person wants to get elected or they want to stay in power at whatever expense it is. So if it is currently religion, they do it. If it's caste system, they do it. Whatever whatever it takes. So what is it that can be done or what do you foresee based on your experience and your expertise in this field? What is it that the current generation can really take to make a difference? Even if it means taking a small level and making a difference to what yeah. needs to be done. Well, you see, the question is if you have a democracy, you will have a political agenda. You can't escape from it. If you have a vote and you are going to exercise it, you have to have a political agenda. Otherwise, how will you know how to cast your vote? Unless you go and cast your vote because somebody gave you a thousand rupees. Uh, you will have to have a political opinion. The question is not that. The question is whether these problems exist and the question is what is the answer. If one religion has decided that they are going to fight tooth and nail, India has not harmed any religion. In fact, when we were 100% Hindus, we welcomed the Jews and the Parsis and everywhere else they disappeared or were persecuted. But India did not. India suffered thousand years of uh, foreign rule. 
but we still survive. So the, it's not a question that they, it's a clash of religions uh, at all, as far as the Hindu Muslim is concerned. The question of a clash of religion comes only with Christianity because they want to do conversion. If they didn't want to do conversion, we have no problem with Christianity. Yes? The, the flip side to that the argument, I would say, is we have had a very uh, historical thought in the sense that we welcome people. Where? Everywhere. Yes. Into the country. Yes. That's, that's our civilization, that's our culture. Yes. We take pride in that. We give them what they want. <coughs> we treat them as guests. And then we are happy if they are going to rule us. And no, at that part, I, <laughs> that is your distorted version. <laughs> I, I don't think we are winning slaves, that uh, we are happy if they But we are not ready to fight. That is not true either. Look at Islam. In Persia, 100% Islam. They were originally uh, Zoroastrians. They became 100%. Whole Middle East. The whole of Europe became 100% Christian. But a thousand years of both Islam and Christianity put together sequentially, even then undivided India was 75% Hindu. The fighting was done by uh, Vijayanagaram Empire, it was done by Shivaji, it was done by Marathas, it was done by Rani Jhansi, it was done by Rana Pratap, it was done by Katta Bowman, it was done by uh, Rani Chennamma in Karnataka. <coughs> Anybody who knows Karnataka history, it was done by a whole series of people. Unfortunately, most people don't know this because our history books, there'll be one chapter for each Mughal emperor, but Vijayanagara emperor, one paragraph. It ruled for 300 years the Vijayanagara empire and covered more area than uh, Aurangzeb did at the peak of his power. So I won't go into that. Let's not go into a diversion. I'll come to the central point was the one thing that any, any youngster can do, go and learn Sanskrit. That's all. Everything else will fall in place automatically. If you can't learn Sanskrit, make someone else learn Sanskrit in a younger generation to you. But learn Sanskrit, all these things that I tell you of a new perspective of your history will automatically come to you. You know, Shanghai, if you look at the city, yeah. it's very clean, everything runs very smoothly, you know, excellent public transportation. Look at a city like but you have not the water in Shanghai, no? Right. <laughs> and if you look at a city of Bangalore, exactly. right. that water is not clean. No. Right. Yeah. And then you see Bangalore, their pockets were very modern, you know, someplace that I would assume that Americans would live there and be just fine. But then there are some times where the decision making process is so slowed down because of the red tape and bureaucracy that sometimes something like a, like a road that needs to be built is delayed far longer than it should be. So you think that the unilateral system in China and then the democratic system in India. How do you see this question? and which one do you see coming out ahead in the long run, economically? Well, if you want that detailed answer, read my book. It's called uh, Financial Architecture and Economic Development uh, of China and India, uh, which is published in India, but you get go to Amazon.com, you'll, uh, you'll get it. The short answer is, if you want a Shanghai in Bangalore, or a Shanghai in Bombay, all you have to do is make one policy decision. And that is that FDI in real estate will be permitted. And that uh, the land will be given for 99-year-old lease without any cost. That's exactly what China did. None of the buildings in Shanghai, none of the buildings in Beijing are built with Chinese money. They are built with foreign money. And because China has said that land will be given to you at 99 year lease, you don't have to buy the land. And you can bring FDI, you can charge any rent you want, you can do what you like. Are you ready to have that policy? Then you will get it in no time. You don't need to give up democracy for that, just change policy. Second. Many of the things that are happening in China are not being reported. India has a disadvantage. Everything in India is stopped. I ask one question, why is it that India has never had a famine? We had food shortages, but we never had a famine. China had one famine in 1959 or 61 where 32 million people died. 32 million people died. 
This is not my estimate. This is Chinese government estimate. But of course they didn't say it then. They are saying it now. That during Mao Zedong's madness on Great Leap Forward, this is what the, 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 the result. Chinese financial system is so brittle that one thing going wrong, it will have a blow up. It's not unexpected. We, the whole world thought that Argentina, Chile and Brazil will be the future developed countries of the world. In 1981 they had a blow up, they never recovered from it. East Asia was thought to be a great, they are called them East Asia Tigers. In fact, World Bank wrote a book saying, East Asia is doing so well because they got their basics right and everybody should learn from them. Within two years of writing that book, East Asia had a blow up in 1997. And they are not recovered from it. Because they didn't get their basics right. China's financial system, their banks are bankrupt. They, are, uh, uh, they have all kinds of restrictions which have put them into great difficulty, for example. The whole Americans are going on hammering uh, revalue, revalue, revalue. Why the Americans are doing this? Because they know that if you go on saying that, the world will think that China will revalue and all kinds of money will come, speculative money will enter China. And then one day the Chinese, they will realize that China is not going to revalue and all that money will come out and there will be a crisis. That's how they created the East Asian, uh, East Asian crisis also. They knew that their financial system is brittle and they found that Japanese were going on buying everything up in, uh, in the United States including Rockefeller Center. So they raised the interest rate of the bond market and all the hot money came running out and they collapsed. So the financial system is so brittle in China, it can have a blowout. <coughs> India has a problem with this financial system, Maraji, because our state government budgets and central government budget both are bankrupt. Even the state, the central government budget is bankrupt. And we are going to have a crisis in a couple of years of that. But India has got institutions which will correct for it and renew itself. And we have the capacity throughout the leaders who do not perform. Governments have changed in the past. After all, the economic reform came because Rajiv Gandhi's government was defeated, BP Singh's government was defeated. And some of us came into office and we were able to do it. And Nasima Rao, of course, deserves the full credit for it because he had the political sagacity to get it implemented. So I, I, I would say, how do you compare India and China? Well, I mean, if you ask me, at a point of a gun to say which is doing better, I would say India is doing better. But both India and China have problems and both of them are going to have a crisis within the next two, three years.